Gary and his friends, we all lived, uh, I think, an unbridled life. He was just um, a very special young man. You know, he studious and kept to himself more than running around. He didn't run around. He didn't pick on us girls. But he was very, he was basically quiet, but, but if yeah. you remember, he had a really great dry sense of humor. Yeah. He's always, seemed like he always had a smile on his face, laughed at anything he said, laughed. Little old skinny kid, you never would think he would mount to anything, really. But he liked a rough house with the rest of us, and uh, we got, everybody got along good with him. He was always impeccably dressed. Always, didn't matter where you saw him. Gary was like a Boy Scout. Uh, he didn't have any any of the vices and all, and uh, he was just a, a very nice young man. I would describe him as brave and um, very caring about uh, everyone. He was very focused, I think. He was so kind, he was, to everybody. He didn't pick, uh, didn't get into scuffles. He was just a kind, good, all-around person. He really My brother and all of his friends were a little older. I think when they were 11, they formed the Boy Scout Troop, um, number 31. Yes, I first met Gary when we was in the Scouts together. His, his mother, at one time, Cub Scouts had what they called a den mother, and she was a den mother, and we used to meet up in her basement. His dad, he helped, he wasn't a senior scoutmaster, but he helped a lot with the camping trips we'd go on, stuff like that. And his mother, we always had Kool-Aid cookies or something she always made for our snacks at the meetings. Gary worked very hard in the Scouts. He did uh, achieve the uh, God and Country Medal. I know he was very proud of that, and my parents were very proud of him. We did not have school buses in the city. And so parent, you know, you either walked to school or parents took you to school, which was fine for Rivermont because that was very close, but the high school was not close to us. And so we had three families, that the, the Miller family, my family, and the Carter family, and sometimes the Payton family, it, you know, we, we carpooled. So, you know, so we were, but, and yeah. God bless Gary, I, he probably hardly ever got a word in edgewise because it was <laughs> Bonnie and me and, oh, no. and my cousin Katie rode very often and, and Linda Payton. So, you know, so Gary just probably got to say good morning and I, that's have a nice it. day. I'm having you all. <laughs> His senior year, he went out for the wrestling team, which was a big surprise, really. He did all right, but they, they didn't have a very good team back then. But see, he did such amazing things um, in high school. He really wanted to pursue architecture. We both graduated in 65. Oh, okay. And uh, I didn't see much of him after that because I got drafted and he went to junior college and I went on to NOM in, in 66 and uh, he, he finished up his college. Uh, I think he struggled, you know, with staying behind and I remember being at my grandma Lance's farm one Sunday when he uh, kind of made the decision that he was going to join. And that was, you know, very um, kind of upsetting to my mom. And, um, and but I think he was determined if his friends were going to Vietnam that he was going to go to. So... Gary often wrote letters home, and in one letter from Fort Jackson, South Carolina, he describes some of the aspects of basic training. 
He wrote, we stay very busy during the day and then what the drill sergeant calls our free time and is spent cleaning on the barracks. Sometimes we work in the dark to finish because the light must be out by 930 every night. Between June and December 1967, Gary attended the Officer Candidate School in Fort Benning, Georgia. He came back to Covington one night. We were up at a family, well, a, a hangout for the young people. But I was sitting there in my car one night, and a car pulled up just inside of me. And I looked and it was Gary. And he waited for me to come over. So I got in the car with him and uh, we were talking. At the time he had already made second lieutenant. And uh, I was kind of shocked, you know, cause Gary wasn't the type that really outgoing or whatever that would uh, I didn't think would ever be an officer. He was going to Nam, and uh, he wanted to talk to me to fill him in on some of the things to look out for. Because he was going over with the uh, Red One, First Division, and I knew they were down south at the time. We were down there about four months before we moved on up. He said, you know, officers don't last very long over here. He said, I think he said about 10 seconds. I said, I wouldn't worry about it. I said, just do your job and you'll be all right. He, had, he said he had to go back for more training and, and then he was going overseas. And I wished him luck, and, I, and that was the last time I really saw him. I was in the Army, stationed in Fort Lee, Virginia, in Petersburg, and we used to have another bowling alley here called Monroe Lanes. Oh, absolutely. Well, I was home. It was late on a weekend night. I was sitting back in the snack bar by myself. And the lady who was working uh, looked up, well, here came Gary walking in. Well, I hadn't seen Gary since the college, at least two years prior. Well, he came in, we spoke, and he sat down at the table. Just general chat, I thought he was still in school. I said, Gary, what's going on in your life? He said, well, I'm in the Army. He says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm in the Army, too. Told him where I was. I said, well, what are you doing in the Army? And I have to admit, I was a little shocked. He says, I'm a lieutenant. I'm an infantry lieutenant in the Army. And he said, I'm fixing to go to some school, man school. And he said, then I know, he said, I'm going to Vietnam. He said, they've already told me that. So we talked a little bit more about school and things we had done. And, Probably the whole conversation lasted 15 minutes. Well, he said, well, I've got to go. Sure was nice seeing you. It's not the same. So he got up and he walked from here to that doorway. And he turned around and did like that. So I got up and walked over to him and he hugged me. He said, this will probably be the last time I ever see you. He says, I won't be coming home from Vietnam. He says, I want to go, and I'm going to go. But he says, I won't be home. He said, thank you for being my friend. I remember, uh, you know, when we drove Gary to the airport, when he was um, leaving uh, Covington for, you know, after our Thanksgiving Christmas uh, weekend and, uh, you know, as his plane flew off, you know, my mom had said, well, I'll never see him again. Gary left for Vietnam as a second lieutenant on December 21st, 1968, for assignment with the 1st Battalion, 28th Infantry, the Black Lions. 
In a letter he wrote to back to his family as soon as he arrived in Vietnam, he wrote, Receive my orders just a few minutes ago for my unit assignment. It's the 1st Infantry Division, the big red one. I'll be leaving here for my unit sometime tomorrow. We're in the dry season here, and it should last until June. I met Gary. Gary was was introduced to the comp my company in Vietnam, the 1st of the 28th Infantry, Black Lines. And he originally was going to be my replacement. But before we could get him in the field, we had two other platoon leaders, one get killed and one get wounded. And so they gave Gary uh, one of the other platoons. Our platoons were Lima Mike in November. And they gave Gary Lima platoon. I was, I was assigned to be his mentor. And uh, so the first mission, first mission, and we would go out for 14 days, um, I, I went with, with Gary and to help him kind of learn the ropes, setting up an ambush and stuff like that. It, it was very tax, taxing. Uh, you, we would go out for 14 days at a time. And on the seventh day out, we would get resupplied. And, uh, and then we would come back, come back in off of a mission for uh, two, da two days and three nights. And, uh, and then go back out again. We were constantly ambushing and, and hunting down the bad guys. The men didn't get a lot of sleep. But I, I only knew him for about a, a month and, and uh, we, didn't, we didn't sit down and, and, and talk a lot. And uh, he was one of these leaders that that the men wanted to follow. He didn't command them to follow. Uh, he had, uh, he had very good leadership, uh, traits and, uh, the men liked him. I know that his, his mother told my mother several times he sent money to send flowers to his, to his fiance or to his grandmother Miller. We, we were on a 14-day uh, mission, and we'd been out for two or three days and hadn't made contact. And, uh, and then that we got our coordinates to set up an ambush. And so uh, it, was on a, it was on a trail. Uh, we're actually a junction of two trails. And uh, I put Gary in his platoon. Uh, ambushing one trail and me and my platoon um, ambushing another trail that night. He was, and he was only about 50 yards away from me, the, the other platoon. They set up an ambush and, uh, and I didn't really think there was going to be anything happening that night. There was no, no sign of traffic on those trails. And so uh, I thought I was just going to get a good night's sleep, but uh, about Three o'clock in the morning, I was awoken by uh, his platoon set off their Claymore mines and started shooting. And uh, the first thing that went through my mind was, oh, shit, those guys have, have uh, got trigger happy and set, the, set everything off. So I got up and walked over to Gary's position. And uh, that's when he, he said, no, that they had movement. And uh, we looked out, we called in a, illumination rounds and we looked out and I could see two or three bodies laying out there in the kill zone. I was talking to Gary and since this was his first, first time to, to pop an ambush, um, I told him, I said, well, you call it back into the, to the battalion. And, uh, and so he did, he, he called in and said what happened and how many people they, they saw laying out in the kill zone and uh, but we had a battalion xo who was back in a bunker back in the rear end and he he told gary that he wanted him to sweep the kill zone to make sure of the body count and uh so i started to tell gary what i would have done is 
is I would have just, I wouldn't have swept the kill zone looking for a body count because at daybreak, if it was anybody there, they'd still be there. And, uh, but he didn't. And, and so we, we had a squad from each, each platoon, uh, start sweeping the kill zone. And, and then they just got into it and heard rifle shots. And I really thought it was one of the, one of the guys shooting. And I was afraid that they were going to not know where the other squad was and they might shoot each other. Right after I hollered cease fire, something hit me right in the chest. And it was, it reminded me like I was a, uh, a catcher and had missed the ball and it just, bam, it hit me in the chest. And I don't know why, but I hollered grenade and I, I rolled over. And, and uh, when I hollered grenade, uh, Gary jumped on the grenade. When I, when I went over to Gary and I touched him, I knew he was dead. So I, uh, I rolled him over and, uh, he had, my rifle was underneath him and, uh, it had blown, it had blown my, the receiver of my rifle up in a magazine. So I got Gary's rifle and, uh, put a new, put another magazine in it and went, went looking for the guy that threw the grenade. The, the night that, that uh, Gary died, that was the beginning of a, of a, of a long, long day for me. But the next morning after, after it was all over and we, we took care of, the, of Gary's body and, and uh, the weapons that we had picked up from the ambush we, that was popped, we, I, I consolidated the two platoons together and we went to move out. And uh, we had only gotten just a little ways, and my, my point man walked into an ambush, and uh, and then all hell broke loose again. And uh, so we we fought for a few hours, and then uh, everything calmed down, and the battalion called me up and said they were sending helicopters in to pick us up. And so they picked us up and we left. Then he got shipped out before Christmas, and then he died in February. So he was not there, but maybe, you know, two and a half, three months. And, um, you know, his letters at that time were very sporadic. It was very difficult, you know, when we got the word uh, that he had died. And then I think it was like, uh, you know, a few days later, we received letters that he had written just the week before. You know, you you live with these you live with these things for the rest of your life, and until you know that another human being gave his life for you, it puts a whole perspective on things. People can say, "Yeah, I'll do this or I'll do that," but until it really happens, they don't really know what they'd do, and. In the military, we're trained and, and conditioned that we would give our life for our for our brother, and uh, and guys do. It's not unusual uh, when you're fighting right beside somebody. You develop a bond that's that uh, lasts forever.
Um, I certainly think it was his willingness to give his life for his men um, and his country. He was willing to sacrifice that. But at the same time, you know, he was also just a regular person, right? But he could find that source of um, strength in himself. He died trying to make a difference in the, in the war. He saved some lives. Uh, his comrades, I'm sure today, are still just as thankful as they can be because he's granted him years of life. I was really proud to have been associated with him. What he did overseas was uh, something that a person just doesn't do. Just uh, for him to save the rest of his squad or whatever and so forth was just something you don't even think about. To, to do what he did in the military to, to deserve this award, it does not surprise me a bit. I mean, he's the kind of guy that would do something like that. He, he, uh, he was all out 100% boy and grew into a nice young man. Served the country and served it well.